Thanks so much. Um, it's great to be here again. I, I was at this conference two years ago, and I've enjoyed it tremendously. I met all sorts of interesting people, and I'm always amazed by the breadth of knowledge. Because as I've been talking to my colleagues here, I mostly spend my time in the lab. So I have some depth, but, you have, but they have way more breadth. So this is also a wonderful opportunity for me to, to get some breadth and get, get some larger perspectives on the phenomenon that uh, I'm interested in and that are very interested very interesting for the field, field of psychology and I hope philosophy and aesthetics as well. And that phenomenon is preferences. So when we perceived objects of many kinds, of, uh, some of which I will show you shortly, we uh, form evaluative judgments. We say things, this is beautiful, likable, well-designed, attractive, valuable, cute. When we go into social judgment, we may say things that, uh, things that are evaluatively uh, uh, biased, so trust, well, we say pe that people are trustworthy, that people are smart, and these are forms of preferences because there's always a value conveyed in there. So um, I'll give you some examples because these are the things that I'm trying to understand. So let's just take, you know, you're walking down the street in beautiful uh, San Diego, California, and uh, this is a picture from my neighborhood. And you not only see a house, you instantly see an ugly house. Here is another uh, uh, house from my neighborhood, not particularly beautifully designed, still costs a million dollars. And these are other houses that maybe are a little bit more impressive. Here are some cars. This is a, a Polish car. Uh, this is a French car. This is an Ameri American car. And you can immediately see that these cars are prettier better somehow than uh, the cars on top. Um, here's another uh, shot from San Diego, or this is from Los Angeles. This is my neighborhood in Warsaw. These are ugly neighborhoods. These are prettier parts of Warsaw and Los Angeles. Uh, we evaluate products. A lot of money is now spent on beautiful products, uh, computers, kettles, desks, speakers, um, lamps, balls, things like that. And of course, people spend an enormous amount of time on art. I live in uh, La Jolla, California, so we have uh, uh, two art galleries that are, uh, two, uh, that are very popular. One represents an artist called uh, David Weiland. This is one of his uh, uh, nicer pieces. Another is Thomas Kincaid. This is one of his uh, better pieces. And uh, if you Google those artists, you will actually find them under the category of bad art. Bad art as opposed to you know, Mark Rothko or, or Mona Lisa. And even in classical arts, there are more and less successful examples of, of creating of blends or, or, or now photographically creating blends of things. So we immediately feel certain preference, certain reaction to those things. Uh, I don't have to tell you that when we see people, we find preferences, we like them or, or, dis, uh, or dislike them. So, the, uh, the puzzle of where these preferences come from or how these preferences are constructed, where do they derive from, has fascinated people for years, psychologists, uh, philosophers, aestheticians. And there are books written on beauty and on ugliness. There are even like formulaic books to tell you how to create beautiful art. You can go to art school, you can learn how to create, you can create beauty. And lots of these books, um, or lots of these instruction manuals, basically will try to f identify features of things or particular elements kind of, uh, of, 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 a, of a work of art or, or a product that make it beautiful. That's kind of a very much an object-oriented uh, approach. Today, I'm going to argue that you can go beyond this kind of feature-based and object-oriented approach into something called an experiential approach. And to set up this experiential approach, I'll just remind you of an old anecdote that is known, at least in psychology, uh, about Benjamin Franklin, who was asked uh, by a colleague to advise him on a choice of a life mate, of a woman that he should marry. And uh, Franklin came up with this idea of what is now known as the Franklin Ledger, that you should take a piece of paper. On the left side, you should write positive attributes of your potential mate. 
on the right side you should write negative attributes of potential mates. You might assign weights to your attributes, presumably being clean is less important than being smart, or um, if, for some people at least. Um, and you should simply subtract positive, uh, negative attributes from positive ne attributes. So in this particular case, uh, Franklin said that he should fall in love with this woman, he should marry her, express his preferences, because she definitely had more positive features, uh, negative features. So in a more abstract way, you basically, uh, this idea is that uh, evaluative judgment, liking judgment, judgments of beauty, are in some sense derived through a process of basically counting features, at assigning a value to them, and uh, doing some form of algebraic uh, you know, calculation. Okay. But we've known that uh, people have another way of accessing and building or constructing the preferences where they can rely on their experiences, right? Uh, experiences being basically products of some computation that manifests themselves to consciousness as a form of a feeling or a state. So today I want to tell you about these experiences, about the role of these experiences and how they work in preferences. So I'm going to be talking about this kind of non-propositional, non-analytic input, so something that's maybe not further decomposable, at least to the, to the perceiver, to the, to the experience, experiences of this thing. And I'm going to remind you that, of course, you already know about experiences, you know, affective experiences, right? So there are famous studies in psychology that when people are asked to judge economy, uh, the economy, they uh, make more positive predictions when the weather is sunny than when the weather is cloudy. When people are making gambles, so uh, deciding whether they should uh, gamble a dollar or 10 cents, they are influenced by these incidental cues like, for example, pictures of sexy women that are flushed. They can be flushed uh, superliminally or subliminally. Or even decisions to fall in love, or at least temporarily feel an attraction to someone, can be influenced by incidental things as walking across a bridge that makes a person aroused. And if you're aroused and the, the, the target of your affection, potential affection is right there, people say that they fall in love. And so there are lots of psychological experiments that play this game that's called misattribution of arousal or of experiences. So you know already about all this work. But today I, will, I, want, I want to argue that preferences, and actually <clears throat> maybe uh, even more important for, uh, kind of preferences is formed through the use of what I like to call, or people call, cognitive experiences. So what are cognitive experiences? Well, these are experiences that actually uh, already have been described by William James. Uh, so he spent a lot of time in his famous uh, uh, introduction to psychology on these states that he calls fringe experiences and basically involve um, uh, you know, feelings, uh, feeling-like states that accompany cognitive activity. So it could be a sense of familiarity. Or it could be sense that your thoughts come together easily, that they're coherent, that they, are, uh, that they fit together, that there is a sense of integrity or rightness, or there is a sen sense of strangeness. And you can see I try to produce these on, on the right here. I try to produce various feelings here. And you can see some of them are obvious. You know, this building is probably quite familiar to you, at least to Richard. It's quite familiar since he has a friend, John, who often goes to London. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this is a b building at, on my campus, UCSD campus, which you now might be slightly familiar with because you might recognize the structure similarity to the UCSD logo. Um, uh, this is, uh, the interesting thing goes, uh, there are some interesting things going on in this uh, painting by the Shirko because he's trying to produce a sense of, of strangeness or incoherence by basically uh, mixing shadows uh, in a way that is incoherent with the direction of the sun. So, so when we watch these pieces of art, where we watch these structures, where we watch faces, we have those, we have those feelings. So I'm going to be talking about how these feelings are generated and how they can enter our uh, evaluative judgments, our, our, our preferences. So, so how are these feelings generated? So I won't go too much into this, but I basically believe that, uh, that you know, Gestalt psychologists were pretty much right uh, in telling us that we are constantly looking for structure in the world, right? So we constantly completing patterns, see a triangle here, or a Loch Ness monster here, or a sphere here. Often we, this process cannot settle, 
So in the connection sense, the network does not settle. So as an example of that particular uh, impossible picture, sometimes the network settles on something that doesn't exist, like in this uh, example of pareidolia or illusory face. There is no face here. And we often, uh, uh, this is a famous study in social domain where people impose uh, a meaning structure on basically a physical movement of triangles and squares and, and tell a social, uh, social story. So we constantly, when we see stimuli, when we see objects, when we see movies, we impose structure. Okay. This search for structure can be successful, not successful, can be easy or more difficult and will result in an experience. So I'll just give you one example. Uh, I'm just going to be using one term for this experience. I'm going to call it the experience of fluency. So I will try to create in you an experience of fluency. You'll see how successful I am. So if you would, <clears throat> this might be obvious to people who study psychology, but for non-psychologists it will be interesting. So presumably, uh, look at this um, collection of dots, of random, well, seemingly random dots. So non-psychologists, you know, people who haven't seen, seen this before, can you figure out what it is if you're seeing this for the first time? A dog. A dog. Indeed, it is a dog. It's a Dalmatian dog, right? So as, as it reveals its structure, and if you think this for the first time, you have an experience of integrality, of rightness, things cohere. And the next time now you're looking at this, this picture is fluent in the sense that the, or the, the transition from a, from a percept to the concept or to the organized perception is very fast. So fluency is basically the idea that, that, that processing of anything can be easy, <clears throat> efficient, error-free, or can be sluggish, um, filled with errors and, and inefficient, and that this processing is, uh, you know, has a feel to it, has a subjective phenomenal tinge to it. And that, so it feels easy uh, and structure, or, or, or uh, it's not integrated, it's, it, it's incoherent. The interesting thing about uh, the fluent, this idea of fluency and how it relates to preferences is, that already uh, William James and William Titchener and many other psychologists noticed that these, these, these fringe experiences, they don't, they don't feel only cognitive. It, you never get a sense of just rightness. That the, the sense of rightness or familiarity or fluency or integrality comes with an affective tinge. So Titchener called it the warm glow of familiarity. Uh, we call it the warm glow of fluency. So every time when you, for example, uh, discover some structure, for example, the woman here on the zebra, or here this le leopard and his victim here, um, the leopard broke the camouflage, so he ate this poor deer or antelope. So when you are making this discovery, you, it feels good, right? And there's all sorts of reasons why actually the system should be designed to reward successful recognition. Obviously, this maintains the search, right? If I'm getting a little pat on my back, a little uh, internal reward for finding something interesting in the environment that, keep, that keeps me uh, looking. So, and so in some sense, it's kind of an obvious thing that this is a way for the system to, uh, so to promote search and to promote dis discovery. There might be some sort of internal systemic reasons where incoherence or when the network, internal network doesn't settle down, it produces basically a high degree of, of neural noise or basically a, 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 a degree of, and it's basically costly for the system to be in a high energy state. So there might be some sort of internal reason. And many people argue that, um, you know, people like Gigerenzer and that, that often these feelings like fluency or familiarity are associated with value because they are cues to um, basically a, a status of an object in the environment. So I give you a bunch of chemical names and I make uh, one chemical name very difficult to pronounce and I ask you how dangerous it is. You're going to say that this unpronounceable chemical is more dangerous than pronounceable chemical. And you're probably just e expressing some sort of heuristic that, you know, if that w well known things like apples and pears are safe things and strange things are the unsafe things. So, so there is a warm glow of, of fluency. Okay. So, so in 
my research, we've done uh, way too many studies uh, trying to understand what variables control fluency and, and how these changes in fluency and liking uh, are, pr uh, are produced. I'm going to give you, uh, show you some of these factors, and I'm going to zoom in on a factor that allows us to interestingly pit the fluency theory of, 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 of preferences against some other you know, prominent theories. So what makes you like things? Okay, so there is my, this is my recipe book for how you cr create preferences. And believe it, believe, it, believe it or not, business people love this type of stuff um, uh, because they, they try to sell products. They're not necessarily in, are interested in art. So, so I'm, sh I'm sure uh, Professor Stelmach will tell me that this is not about art, it's about design. It's not about beauty, but it's about just liking. But um, so here are some, some tricks to pr produce at least liking. So if you want to make a desk more likable, you can use a psychological technique called priming. So you can uh, precede uh, this presentation of this object with a related object, which in that case would be a contour of another desk, as opposed to like a contour of a bird. Or you can even use a related word. Chair is associatively related to desk. Lamp isn't associatively related to desk. So you can make people either perceptually prime or conceptually prime, and if, if you, even if you do it a very subtle way, they'll find the desk to be prettier. Uh, of, obviously, you can do repetition, uh, boring, using boring polygons, or using actual pieces of art. So this is um, uh, a work that I've done with Helmut Leder, who is a professor of aesthetics in Vienna. So there's actually a faculty of experimental aesthetics in Vienna, and we did this kind of really silly thing uh, that we basically flipped uh, famous paintings, and what you get is this remarkably strong effect that pe uh, students uh, who don't even know a painting, most students would know that this is a Mona Lisa, but they would actually not know the correct orientation. They find that Mona Lisa to be rather ugly, and they're quite happy with that Mona Lisa, even though when they ask, they cannot tell which, which Mona Lisa is the, the correct Mona Lisa. So this is obviously is the result of perceptual experience, or repetition, and some sort of uh, facilitation of processing. You know, you can enhance contrast, duration, clarity, and make, peop uh, make things more likable. You can increase also symmetry of an object. Um, for, cognitive, for simple cognitive reasons, uh, symmetric objects are um, computationally easier. I'm asymmetric, so if you see my right side of the face, you see one piot, and if you see this side of, fa of my face, you see another piot. So your brain has to work harder to represent my pain. Uh, my, my face. You cannot just do a simple rotation. So it's computationally costly to, to rotate, and so the degrees of symmetry uh, are associated with the ease of processing, which then leads to, uh, to higher liking. And this is not uh, restricted to uh, visual domains. You can do a similar trick, trick with um, uh, more conceptual material. So if you ask people um, how true is it that birds of a feather flock together? How true is this uh, statement? So you get, you know, 65 people to agree. It is true because, you know, people, similarities attract. But if you ask them, you know, some people say that birds of a f f there is the saying, birds of a feather flock conjointly. So you change, you make, you express the same cognitive content, but you do it in semantically or syntactically awkward way. So you get less agreement among people that this is actually represents a true state of, of the world. So it's kind of an illusion of truth effect that kind of, can be played with. There's a very cute study on, on uh, stock tickers uh, where uh, these are basically uh, shorts, shorthands for uh, companies that are on the uh, New York uh, stock exchange market. And if this K KAG is more pronounceable than KGH, so it's easier for people to say that uh, 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 abbreviation, that that abbreviation, and uh, investors, in the, their initial decisions show a bias towards more pronounceable um, uh, uh, tickers. There is a, a phenomenon that I was actually mentioning to Professor Swinburne when we were talking. That it's a nice application of this idea to to, to motor behavior. So as you going through uh, a store you might want to reach for one of those juices, and that reach can be more complicated or 
uh, less complicated. Sometimes you have to reach around, you have to uh, lean. And so people have experimentally manipulated this and just simply ask uh, for preference judgment for products. And the products that are associated with harder, uh, less fluent motor behavior tend to be less preferred that, uh, uh, than product products that are associated with higher fluency. Um, yeah, so, um, and, yeah, so maybe I'll just, uh, enough on motor fluency. Uh, so one phenomenon that I want to zoom in, and I, I hope this is a good test of this theory, because it basically contrasts this theory against other theory, is, um, and I think it's intrinsically interesting, is um, uh, how this theory explains one of the most famous effects in, in preferences, in psychological preferences, and that is the effect of prototypicality. So uh, there, was a, there was a faculty member at University College London where I occasionally uh, am, uh, visit. His name was Francis Galton, and he came up with uh, this very nice contraption where he would superimpose pictures um, such that they would project one image. So this is a, these are several uh, pictures kind of uh, stuck uh, together. And he discovered that if he puts a bunch of uh, uh, Boston doctors together, or even evil looking Irishmen, so because he was interested in the idea that if you put a bunch of Irishmen together, you will you, they will create a very nasty looking Irishman. But to his prejudicial uh, mind, he would feel the data were strong enough to realize that this is, instead of becoming very nasty Irishman, it actually improves the, 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 the the, 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 the composite Irishman is better looking than the composites that were put into it. So here, uh, this um, is of course known as the beauty in averageness effect. So if you take these two uh, good looking uh, individuals and you put, uh, blend them together, you come up with uh, uh, a better person, a bit more attractive person. So there, are, there might be matters of taste here, uh, but this is a very robust phenomenon. It's empirically, it's a very strong phenomenon. It's very easy to reproduce it in the lab. And so, so there has been, this phenomenon has been taken to basically um, indicate that our mind has a, a module, or there's version strong, very obviously strong commitment to modularity, but there is a, at least a detector of uh, deviation in the population. So, uh, evolution equipped, equipped us with a device that basically checked um, a, a distribution of traits and selects against, against extreme. And this is a good thing because most of the time we're dealing with stabilizing selection. So the level, the mouse is the, the size that is right for its ecological niche. If it was larger, it wouldn't fit into a hole. If it was smaller, it would uh, subject to the predators. So most traits are stabilized at, on the, at, the, uh, at the level. So if you in the mating market, as you might be, you want to uh, choose a person that is kind of like um, the perfect bear, not too big, not too small, right? You want to select the average. And that's, that's, that's what evolution, help, your evolutionally involved mind helps you to do. But we argue that actually this phenomenon can be trivially explained uh, by just assuming that uh, what the mind does, and Peter Garden first has beautifully explained this, is basically constantly created averages from the experiences, right? So when you're looking, uh, this attractive gentleman, you create even better looking guy if you put them to, uh, uh, together. So basically what this uh, theory says is that Beauty and evidence effect is just basically another manifestation of our preference for, for processing ease, for, for simplicity, for efficiency. And one nice advantage of the fluency theory is that it can actually explain why you can produce beauty and evidence effect not only with faces, but you can produce it with fish, cars, uh, birds, all sorts of stimuli. And why beauty and evidence effect is incredibly you can, uh, it, it's very dependent on your uh, uh, local exposure. So there was a study actually using real preferences, not the just cheap talk, where people were buying cars and expressing preferences for cars, and they chose more prototypical cars on the market, prototypical being defined as an average of cars that are currently on, on the streets. So what we like, what the kind of car we like, the kind of face we like, is basically a locally created 
created prototype. OK. Um, I think I have time, so I'm going to show you one study um, that actually tests this. I'm going to show you how exactly uh, we test this idea of fluency of prototypes. And I'm going to use that study to tell you that what I've just told you is completely wrong. OK. So, um, so, so one way to test the idea that, that, that fluency, that ease of processing generates prototypes, is to use uh, abstract stimuli, completely evolutionary, unrelated stimuli. And we have a lot of stimuli like that in the world. Uh, some of them uh, cost uh, millions of dollars. I think this is the most expensive current pa painting. I think it's $10 million or something like this. This is Jackson Pollock number five. If you want cheaper dots, these are basically a collection of random dots. You can go to Netherlands, buy this uh, painting, uh, so section of pa painting by Herman de Vries. Or you can just go to my lab and I'll sell, sell you very cheaply our connection of random dots that are generated by a random dot generator. Okay, So we have used this paradigm that's an old psychology paradigm, it's Posner and Kiel paradigm. I'm going to just illustrate it with uh, two actually uh, uh, pre-established prototypes, but we've done it actually with random dots, but this is easier to explain. So basically what in the study, what you are going to be looking at these stimuli, so this is a square, this is um, a diamond. And basically, you have to classify them into a categories, basically square and diamond, or category A and category B. The stimuli differ in their distance to the prototype. So this, you can see that this is really a more distorted square uh, than this square. And this is, a, this is a more distorted diamond than this diamond. So you're going to be classifying them A and B. And then going to be rating attractive, attractiveness of, of the stimulus. So we're going to have a measure of your classification time, your fluency, and we're going to have your measure of, attract, uh, measure of attractiveness. So here is what you find. So this is, um, this is a real data graph. So on this axis, you have reaction time, so classification speed. OK. And you can see that as you become, go closer to the prototype from 4 to 1, uh, this line, which is this reaction time, goes down. So you're faster making this decision. This is kind of obvious. You know, I apologize for those of you, but this is basically the idea that it's harder to classify a whale than it's classify a trout or, or pigeon as a bird, bird than, a, and than uh, a finch as a bird. Okay, but you can see here that these classification times really mirror uh, attractiveness. That is, as classification times go down, fluency, uh, attractiveness goes up. And they're actually statistically dependent on each other. So you can show that your liking, your attractiveness judgment is a function of those, uh, uh, of the classification speed. What's more interesting, we, we were able to show in these experiments that you don't have to ask people. It's not just a, it's not just like a functionality judgment. You know, this is a better square or this is a better diamond. But uh, even with random dots, you, people show this effect. And people show this effect on measure, uh, measures of affect, implicit affect. So we attach uh, electrodes to their cheek uh, to measure how much they smile. And people smile more to more prototypical stimuli. So, so this, is, this is not only talk, but this is actually a genuine affective response. So, um, so in some sense, what I've just told you is a very simple story. It's perfectly compatible with what Peter was saying that we create these prototypes. These are efficient representation of category. They can very uh, wonderfully function in our mind. And we have this powerful generalization engine that can detect structure and, 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 and preferences are, are a function of this uh, generation of structure. So this is for those of you who are interested in art. This is basically an analysis that uh, one reason people like Jackson Pollock is because there is actually a structure there. There is a fractal structure in Pollock's painting uh, such that, uh, well, paint, his painting is self-similar, but they're also uh, similar to other arrangements in the environment. So in some, some sense, they are not just random dots. They are uh, structured dots. Uh, and your mind uh, uh, discovers that structure. Okay. Um, so um, there is a puzzle. Okay. And this is the, the more interesting part. OK, so, so far it was just, I think this was what I've told you, what's, what you probably believe anyway. And, and, but this is actually, I think, interesting. 
there is a, the world is filled with examples of successful blending, successful conceptual combination, successful crossings. So uh, people like Bordeaux. Bordeaux is a blend of different wines. Pe people, at least in America, like this idea of a melting point, pot, pot. People would find Haleberry reasonably attractive. I think I, I would probably date her. Um, and Germans love their mixes, a uh, meta mix, which is a blend of cola and orange juice, and so forth and so forth. But <clears throat> here's a, a car that was, I think it was in Krakow for a while, it didn't take off. It was a blend of a horse and, no, this is actually from India. Oh, this looks really, I can make these jokes, but you cannot. So it's just foreigners, you know, <laughs> make these jokes. So anyway, so, but there are cases where, where blending basically uh, uh, fails in a spectacular way. I mean, this car didn't sell very well, perceived, was perceived very ugly. This is a blend of a Porsche and SUV. This is the famous Scottish deep fried sn snicker, not very popular outside of Scotland. The sheep tiger, the, 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 sh the, the sheep woman, uh, or the goat woman the bird dog so these are these are unsuccessful blends so so the question is why is this that some blends you know which are averages you know work and they don't work um, and uh, I think it has also what this phenomenon reveals is that that fluency uh, or these factors that generate preferences always going to work with our conceptual structure and I'm going to try to show you very briefly how that conceptual structure interacts with fluency. So when you look at this Russian car, um, you uh, probably, or at least my brain hurts when I look at this, right? Uh, people don't like these types of things. And I think I don't, they don't like it because um, they are able to discover either perceptually it emerges naturally or conceptually, it emerges that the brand, that average, is basically a composite of two categories. So instead of becoming a prototype, an efficient representation of a category, it actually, the same stimulus can suddenly become an inefficient representation of the category. So what was before a perfect blend becomes a basically a bad representation. And it can turn, the same thing can turn from being a good representation, a light representation, to a bad representation just based, uh, based on manipulation of category boundary. So I'm going to show you in the last uh, five minutes that I have left, or maybe uh, 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 how, you can, how you can create these types of uh, phenomena. OK, so I'd like to start this by uh, encouraging you to visit this website, where you can uh, demonstrate it on yourself, uh, where you can, this is very American, or, uh, where you can design by your own dog, uh, make your own dog by selecting the, br the, the, the mother and father. So you can order a lovely cockpoo, cockapoo, or a gentle puggle, or a charming labradoodle, or here you can order, what is this? Uh, this is a schnoodle, I think this is a, sh is this a schnoodle? Uh, it's a pug and a beagle. So a bugle. I think this is a bugle. This is called a bugle. Okay. And some people absolutely love this. You know, in the comment section of this website, you just see this is like, these are the most beautiful dogs. But then you go to, uh, to uh, deeper into comments, and you realize that dog experts absolutely abhor these things. They think they are just the ugliest things ever created on Earth. And this should be absolutely forbidden. And they moralize this. This is just really wrong to do this. Okay. So we try to recreate this phenomenon in our lab by <laughs> uh, blending categories. So uh, I'm glad you have this reaction, because sometimes it doesn't work in Poland. But in America, I mean, I've, I've showed this in the lecture, there is just this collective expression of pain. I mean, you don't have really have to measure this. It's just, oh, God. So it's worse than the Russian, the Russian car. And, uh, <laughs> 
And of course, we have such, you know, individuals like that everywhere. I mean, this is uh, Elvis Presley's daughter. This is actually in the Netherlands. This is a blend of two fo uh, famous football players. So the Dutch people think this is in this man is incredibly ugly and, and and wrong. So we basically what we did in a study, we basically created these blends of of well-known perceptual categories, celebrities. We basically blended celebrities. We blended Dutch celebrities. And we blended New Zealand celebrities, and we showed the blends and the individuals to Dutch people and to New Zealand people. I actually uh, was going to show you the data, but basically, if you show New Zealand blends to Dutch people, they love the blends, so they rate it higher than the individuals. And New Zealand people love Dutch people overall, but they especially love the blends of Dutch celebrities. But this effect completely flips. If you show Dutch people blended Dutch celebrities and New Zealand people blended New Zealand cele celebrities, basically they show the ugliness in averages effect. So they are disfluent. They uh, they hate them. So I'm going to skip this. You can do it with uh, individuals. Uh, you can do it with races. Uh, Obama is a blend of races. You can cre very easily create a dislike for a person that it's a mixture of of two different uh, races. Uh, you can create dislike for uh, gender blends. At the same time, you, you, you show uh, a beauty and averages effect for gender blends when people don't recognize the gender blends. You can even show that uh, a, a raw, people would like actually a, an android, someone on, something on the border between the human and artificial, but won't like it if they, they, you create a conceptual space for them where they cat categorize it either as a robot or, or as a living thing. So I'm... Um, 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 wrapping up. So basically what I've argued that preferences are uh, obviously there are reasons for preferences and the, you know, you, when you're buying a car you're probably forming your preference based on objective input but you're also using experiences. You're using affective experience but you're also using cognitive experiences. And I think the point that I care about the most is that you can see with these experiences, cognitive experiences, that the, really the beauty is not in the stimulus. There is really not a recipe book for beauty. I cannot tell you to just create an average or just create, um, uh, uh, some, you just create some sort of perceptual space where this thing uh, is going to be, become fluent. Because it's always going to be dependent on what your cognitive activity, how you break down that conceptual space at the time of making a judgment. So fluency is going to be always relative to your categorization and your and your past. So thank you very much. It was your statement that the mind is always looking for structure. Yes. I am not sure. Uh, I don't want to say I don't agree with you, but it's my spontaneous <coughs> remark. But, mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes, if I need explanation, I need objectivity, and I am looking for the structure. Mm -hmm. But if I want to understand, I prefer my intuition, mm -hmm. direct and without objectivity. And it's my problem, probably my wife said that it's my psychological problem, that at the same time I can like something and dislike. Mm -hmm. If uh, I think about the art, sometimes about the people, mm -hmm. too, I can say I like it because of the structure, mm -hmm. of some, the piece of art, mm -hmm. it's perfect, it's, everything is okay, mm -hmm. but at the same time I say because of my intuition, I dislike it. It's mm -hmm. not my kind of interpretation of a world or of mm -hmm. something. Okay. And here is my problem, that uh, my I have this dualism in my opinion. Yes, I think this theory actually predicts, well, maybe I should just, I was going to go back to the beginning. The theory predicts that you should have incoherent preferences, right? Because some preferences are formed on a perceptual basis. So you're going to, you know, like you see some music piece that is written uh, just to, by combining a melody, right? And, and it's going to be per very perceptually fluent. It's going to be just working on these low level factors, we call it the perceptual fluency, and then you're going to have some sort of a conceptual uh, categorization. You, for example, realize that this piece is not novel. It's, it's easy, it's, it's, it's fluent, it's, 
uh, but it's not interesting. So you could have dissociation of, of preferences, and your final judgment is going to be some, some function. But that theory very much opens you, because there are so different sources in which you know, cognitive experience and f preferences can come from, and they can work simultaneously in opposite direction. So I think the average is the perfect example where perceptually, you know, an average face is always going to be fluent, right? Because it's, it's, it, you have, but it might be uh, conceptually disfluent. So you can have a perceptual liking versus conceptual disliking. I hope this makes sense and answers some of it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for this uh -huh. interesting talk. I mean, one comment is, and that is, your model somehow supports my account of how we categorize things. I mean, in terms mm -hmm. of prototypes, and, and mm -hmm. they're making the average of, of, of things. And actually, it struck me that it also fits with, I mean, when people study prototypes, uh, mm -hmm. the reaction time for the prototypical, I mean, to identify something, mm -hmm. the problem is a bird. Yeah. It's much quicker than to identify. Right, that's the Posner and Q. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not easier to, so that supports the fluency mm -hmm. of, of the, of uh, my, my question concerns, I mean, you, you, were, you were mentioning that some blends work better than others, mm -hmm. but you didn't explain why. And also, in, 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 um, <coughs> when does it come that certain blends work better than other blends? Or what is, what is common to the blends that work, so to speak? And the other question is, or comment is then that in art history, or in art uh, theory, I mean, it's symmetries looked down upon. I mean, mm -hmm. Piece of art is supposed to be more interesting if it's, if it's not perfectly symmetric. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There is some kind of tendency against symmetry there. Right. So I think I have an answer to your, definitely to your, which blend, you know, what, how do, when do blends work? So one is uh, this argument that sometimes you have the clash of basically two perceptually very uh, well established categories. So, so when you're blending, you know, the sheep and the tiger, Right, so you already have a very well-established prototype. So it's going to just can generate kind of low-level class. I think if you're blending Obama and Bush, so part of this might be conceptually, they're conceptually incoherent, but I think perceptually you have a very good representation of the, of the faces. So uh, in those blends that work, you cannot recognize, you can, it, it doesn't at least spring to you immediately that she is a, you, that you don't know what race she is, or that, well, Germans say that they don't, have find nothing problematic about cola and orange juice. They just this is just nothing spring nothing wrong springs to them because I think they have a they have a much more wider conceptual space. So I think one is just this uh, perceptual expertise, what I call it, learning, um, and the other one is your task. So in those experiments on on race or on emotional, we actually tell people we force people to categorize it. Is it you know, Asian or is it Caucasian? Is it smile or is it frown? Is it a robot or is it a human being? And then when the task becomes difficult, so because, because the, the thing is in the middle, then somehow the dislike for the task, the, some, the effort of processing just basically spills over to the dislike of the object. Okay. Uh -huh. I wonder to what extent uh -huh. the phenomenon you're describing applies when people are making decisions that they take to be both important <coughs> and subject to pretty objective criteria. Clearly, preference could mm -hmm. still be affected, but they might nonetheless make the decision on the basis that they think is due. So right. just to give you background, remember yeah. the Milgram experiments. Mm -hmm. There, people were really deceived into thinking mm -hmm. they were doing something important, mm -hmm. namely administering shock. Right. But of course, there we have the authority influence. Right. Now, would the kinds of influences you're talking about apply in a situation like that, as opposed to one in which you simply want to get liking A better than B, but mm -hmm. no momentous decision is in the offer? Uh, well, the marriage case is an interesting one, right? Because you, it's a momentous life decision. And I mean, we use beauty to make these decisions, or uh, to date someone, or you know, to stay married, and in, in that sense, uh, if beauty is influenced by, you know, averageness, by these perceptual uh, skills, then you could say that this is a case where momentous decision is influenced by these low-level factors. But even if you're buying a car, um, I'm going to show you one thing. I just love this, this advertisement. 
It's, mo it's really an excuse to show you this ad, but I think you'll like it. Uh, sorry, this is. Oh, this, you can't really read it with well. This, this is an ad for BMW, and it basically it says co uh, costs $32,000, feels like $1 million, savings $970,000. So this is a recent ad for BMW. And I love that ad because it basically tells you that, you know, uh, and what brands like BMWs know, that people buy an experience. So there's a whole field of experiential marketing and high luxury products, I mean, from you know, designer bags, that people pay enormous amounts of money, premium, for, for an experience. So you know, economists care about stuff like that because they, they, they can use these recipe books to really upmark, upmark uh, products. But you know, it, it's, are they going to matter for moral judgments? I would invite a study. We could do a study to what extent perceptual fluency or conceptual fluency versus doing evil intention matter. You know, you could do a competition between those things, and maybe we'll find that these trivial things actually ma ma matter more. Mm -hmm. How far does this transfer to the other senses? Uh, like strawberry or raspberry or anything like that? Yeah, so I um, thank you for asking that question. So, uh, so I mentioned some of these examples from motor fluency. This is actually the Patrick Haggard work and, uh, and examples of like semantic coherence. We've done some work on, on preferences for music. This is very, very simple. It's basically using. Um, uh, it's a paradigm called artificial grammar, but it sounds complicated, but it's really, ba you make a, a, a novel melody make, made of tones, and you um, do a structure, and people learn an implicit structure, and then you play them novel melodies, but they, have, they conform to this implicit, implicit structure. And people show preferences for melodies that have that implicit structure. And so people have done that um, on the level of melody, or even on the level of a voice, so average voices are preferred over non-average voices. So average male voice is preferred. So I think it's going to be fairly general because any time you form a kind of some, you know, perform a cognitive activity, it's going to ger generate some sense of fluency. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.